Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're looking at the Transcendental Argument by Cornelius Van Til. Uh, all this information can be found on Trueform's True WordPress and also in his book, A Survey of Christian Epistemology, page 18 and 19. He writes, Van Til writes, one more point should be noted on the question of method. Namely that from a certain point of view, the method of implication may also be called a transcendental method. We have already indicated that the Christian method uses neither the inductive nor the deductive method as understood by the opponents of Christianity. But that it has elements of both induction and deduction in it. If these terms are understood in a Christian these elements are combined we have what is meant by a truly transcendental argument a truly transcendental argument takes any fact of experience which it wishes to investigate and tries to determine what the presuppositions of such a fact must be in order to make it what it is an exclusively deductive argument would take an axiom such as that every cause must have an effect and reason in a straight line from such an axiom drawing all manner of conclusions about God and man a purely inductive argument would begin with any effect and seek in a straight line for a cause of such an effect and thus perhaps conclude that this universe must have had a cause. Both of these methods are being used, as we all shall see, for the defense of Christianity. Yet neither of them could be thoroughly Christian unless they already presuppose God. Any method, as we pointed out, above all, does not maintain that not a single fact can be known unless it be that God gives that fact meaning is in an and on the other hand if God is recognized as the only and the final explanation of any and every fact neither the inductive nor the deductive method can any longer be used to the exclusion of the other that this is the case that can be realized if we keep in mind that the God we contemplate is an absolute God now the only argument for an absolute God that holds water is a transcendental argument a deductive, deductive argument as such leads only from one spot in the universe to another spot in the universe. So also an inductive argument as such can never lead beyond the universe. In either case there is no more than an infinite regression in both cases. It is possible the smart little girl to ask if God made the universe who made God and no answer is forthcoming. This answer is for instance a favorite reply of the atheist debater Clarence Darrell but if it be said to such opponents of Christianity that unless there be, were an absolute God, their own question and doubts would have no meaning at all. There is no argument in return. It lies the issue. It is the firm conviction of every epistemological self-conscious Christian that no human being can utter a single syllable, whether in negation or in affirmation, unless it were for God's existence. Thus the transcendental argument seeks to discover what sort of foundation the house of human knowledge must have in order to be what it is. It does not seek to find whether the house has a foundation, but it presupposes that it has one. <coughs> we hold that the anti-Christian method, whether deductive or inductive, may be compared to a man who would first insist that the statue of William Penn on the City Hall of Philadelphia can be intelligently conceived of without the foundation on which it stands, in order afterwards to investigate whether or not this statue really has a foundation. Cornelius Van Til, a survey of Christian epistemology, page 18-19. Okay, um, the transcendental argument. Basically, the issue is facts and the interpretation of facts. Now, I'm going to talk about historical Jesus studies because that's something that I know quite a lot about. And I'm going to apply Van Til to historical Jesus studies. I think uh, Van Til is 100% correct that facts um, are not independent of interpretation facts require interpretation and so the question is whose interpretation is the correct interpretation of the facts that means you have to get into the question of what is your epistemological or theory of knowledge base in what you're using to investigate the facts so for example in historical Jesus studies the atheist will come to the historical facts about Jesus and the atheist might say that God uh, that Jesus did not rise from the dead but if this atheist epistemology not all atheists but if this particular atheist epistemology is that history is working forward by chance 
that um, morality is based on evolutionary process, then why would they want to investigate history? Because history presupposes some kind of pattern to investigate. But how do you get a pattern in a situation where your own worldview implies that history is chance? How do you get into uh, an asking questions about moral responsibility in history when there is no moral responsibility in your particular worldview? If you believe in evolution, there is no free will. So in other words, as we look at the intellectual foundation of the historian, we see that the presuppositions are not consistent with the methodology of historical inquiry. The foundations that they're basing their history foundations. So foundations is absolutely important. And I think that a lot of skeptics do not like to go into this subject because it soon it's you soon discover that this um, drum of scientism that a lot of the skeptics con continue to talk about where everything has to be given scientific verification unless it's scientific knowledge it's not viable knowledge the transcendental argument undercuts all that and shows that behind the science is an intellectual epistemological foundation and does your worldview give the right foundation for scientific inquiry and the answer is no and the same is to do with historiography so Van Til's transcendental argument is a I think um, there's a lot there to explore a lot there to develop and I think it's a powerful tool to critique uh, the critics of Christianity uh, because once you begin to unpeel their foundations, you find that their foundations are very weak. What do you think? Please let me know. And folks, this is enjoying this series on Van Til, and I thank the gentleman who's been commentating. Um, if you want me to respond to your comments, you're better off sending me a private message either at um, Athanasius TV or Lollard Preachers. Uh, those are the two channels that I, I'll, I'll pop in from time to time to see if anyone send me any messages. Um, I don't come on this channel very much, so I'll be turning comments off because I can't supervise the comments. Um, Okay, um, information is on trueforms.wordpress um, and information is also to be found in Van Til, a survey of Christian epistemology, to page 204 and 5. On, continuing on the transcendent, since the non-theist is so heartily convinced that Unequivocal reasoning is the only possible kind of reasoning. We must ask him to reason une unequivocally for us in order that we may see the consequences. In other words, we believe it to be in harmony with and part of the process of reasoning analogically with a non theist that we ask him to show us first what he can do. We may, to be sure, offer to him at once a positive statement of our position, but this he will at once reject as quite out of the question. So we may ask him to give us something better. The reason he gives for rejecting our position is, in the last analysis, that it involves self-contradiction. We see again as an illustration of this charge the rejection of the theistic conception that God is absolute and that he has nevertheless created this world for his glory. This, the non-theist says, is self-contradictory and it is no doubt is, from a non-theistic point of view, it appears to be contradictory. The final question is in which framework or in which view of reality the Christian or the non-Christian, the law of contradiction can have application to any fact. The non-Christian rejects the Christian view out of hand as a being contradictory. Then when he is asked to furnish a foundation for the law of contradiction, he can offer nothing but the idea of contingency. What we shall have to do then is to try to reduce our opponent's position to an absurdity. Nothing less will do. Without God, man is completely lost in every respect. 
epistemologically as well as morally and religiously. But exactly what do we mean by reducing our opponent's position to an absurdity? He thinks he already reduced our position to an absurdity by the simple expedient just spoken of, but we must point out to him that upon a theistic basis our position is not reduced to any absurdity by indicating the logical difficulties involved in the concept, conception of creation. Basis, it must be contended that the human categories are but analogical of God's categories, so that it is to be expected that human thought will not be able to comprehend how God shall be absolute, at the same time create the universe for his glory. If taken on the same level of existence, it is no doubt self-contradiction to say that a thing is full and at the same time is being filled. But it is exactly this point that is in question, whether God is to be thought of as, a, as the same level with man. What the anti-theist should have done is to show that even upon theistic basis, our conception of creation in self involves self-contradiction. We must therefore point our opponents back give our opponents better treatment than they give us, we must point out to them that unequivocal reasoning itself leads to self-contradiction, not only from a theistic point of view, but from a non-theistic point of view as well. It is this that we ought to mean when we say that we must meet our enemy on their own. We ought to mean when we say that we reason from the impossibility of the contrary. The contrary is possible, impossible only, if it is self-contradictory when operating on the basis of its own assumptions. It is this to that we should mean when we say that we are arguing ad hominem. We do not really argue ad hominem unless we show that someone's position involves sense con self contradiction. And there is no self contradiction unless one's reasoning is shown to be directly contradictory or to lead to conclusions which are contradictory of one's own assumptions. So there's a lot there that is, some of it's a bit too deep um, but basically what I get out of that is basically the atheist or the skeptic will say that Christianity is not true for X, Y, Z reasons basically you can ask the questions about reality who's got the right foundation so you ask the question about reason is reason immaterial or material is the law not contradiction immaterial or material and if the skeptic says it's immaterial if the skeptic says that law, the law of non contradiction is descriptive of reality then what they've done is made the law of non contradiction part of the material and then if, if it's part of the material the law of non contradiction changes if it changes you can't use it to object to your opponent so it's therefore absurd and self-defeating. So these are the kind of strategies and ideas that Van Til has uh, in his idea of the transcendental argument from as far as I can understand. Um, and so basically, again, it's challenging your opponent and seeing whether they're... F and um, more often than not, well, Skeptics are not consistent when they look at their when we look at their own foundation and critique those foundations. We find internal contradictions to their methodologies. Hi, folks. This is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're looking at the Christic, Christian theistic argument by Cornelius Van Til, and uh, published. Uh, in is a survey of Christian epistemology 190 to 191 Van Til. Uh, you can get it PDF at the Politics 101. And the information that I am reading from today is from trueforms.wordpress.com. Uh, Van Til says so. Then the whole argument between Christ Christian theistic and anti-theistic epistemology stands before us. There is much that might still be discussed. It is possible to enter upon a profitable discussion in many details, however, it was our purpose to speak only of the most important matters. These most important matters were somewhat as follows. First of all, we note the necessity of seeing clearly that Christianity and atheism are intricately interwoven. If one is really a theist, he cannot stop short of being a Christian, and Christianity cannot build upon any foundation but that of a sound biblical theism. 
Accordingly, the argument must constantly be for Christian theism as a whole. We cannot separate, except for the sake of emphasis, between an argument for theism and an argument for Christianity. The absoluteness of God and the inspiration of the Bible are involved in one, and one cannot defend the one without defending the other. In the second place, this whole Christian theistic position must be presented not as something just as little or as great deal better than the other positions, but must be presented as the only system of thought that does not destroy human experience to a meaningful, meaningless something. This is in accord with the teaching of the Bible that those who do not accept Christ are lost. Accordingly, if Christian theism is defensible at all, it must be defensible in this way. And if it is not defensible in this way, it is not defensible in any other way, because any other way of defense reduces the uniqueness of Christianity at once. The question is one of this, no, this or nothing. The argument in favor of Christian theism must therefore seek to prove that if one is not a Christian theist, he knows nothing at all, as he ought to know anything. The difference is not that all men are like know certain things about the finite universe and that something claims additional knowledge, while the others does not. The contrary, the Christian has true knowledge about cows and chickens as well as about God. He does this in no spirit of conceit because it is a gift of God's grace, nor does he deny that there is a knowledge after a fashion that enables the non-theist of God's common grace and therefore does not change the absoluteness of the distinction made about the knowledge and the ignorance of the theist and the non-theist respectively. The method of argumentation will accord with the general position taken so far. It will seek to show that antitheistic knowledge is self-contradictory on its own ground, and that its conception of contradiction even presupposes the truth of Christian theism. It must be the method of impossibility of the contrary, or that of the destruction of the enemy. It must show that the unev unevocal reasoning is self-destructive. Meanwhile, Christian theism has the solemn duty to implicate itself even more deeply into the truth of God as it is revealed in nature and in scripture till the end of time. In the formulation of what it seems to be the truth in order that it may not lose its identity as time goes on, but that rather gain its distinctiveness and therefore in its testimony to the world, mega veristus e prevalenti, uh, prevalabet, Um, what do I say about that? I think that the, basically what he's talking about there I think is an epistemological standoff between the skeptic and the Christian and basically what Van Til is saying, okay, let's have a standoff, let's see whose worldview actually is more realistic and consistent with reality. Basically, if we don't believe in God, you can't even know anything. You might know something after a fashion. You might know a little bit about reality. In existential, not uh, ontological foundation of knowledge, i.e., unless there is a God behind the material to make sure that we're not just living in a, a dream world, then we can't really ultimately know anything. We need to presuppose God in order to really know ultimately what we know. And I think this is the standoff that Van Til is saying in this argument. So basically, we ask the, the we ask the skeptic, how do you know what you know? I know that uh, Saiten Bruggengate asked this question, but we, we ask the question, we can ask, you know, what's the foundation of your knowledge? And the answer to that really is ultimately there isn't one. That ultimately the conclusion is that the presupposition presupposition is well we our foundation is like pragmatism um, because it works or whatever but ultimately that's not enough reality exists and it needs to be explained and it's either a dream it's either imaginary or there is some reason that we can have that it's not imaginary and pragmatism will not save us. Pragmatism doesn't deal with the first order questions of reality. What is reality? Why does it exist? Do we know that it exists? On what basis do we know that it exists? A pragmatic approach just avoids those questions and says well 
you know, it works. We don't have to ask any more questions. But we do because reality is there and these questions need to be answered. And we might be doing our pragmatism and it might be working for a while. But then again, there are different types of pragmatism. There is the William James interested in showing religion had a, a, a role in society. There is the John Dewey kind of pragmatism which was interested in democracy. There was the Pierce kind of pragmatism that was interested in the um, in development of science. So pragmatism can have various uh, motives. So which pragmatism is the right pragmatism? What I'm trying to say is this, that there is a revival in the West at the moment of pragmatism, but pragmatism isn't going to save you from these hard, tough questions that you have to ask about reality. Is this world that we live in a dream world, or is it not? How do we know that it's not a dream world? The Christian position that God is faithful, honest, true, that he is all-powerful, is the best consistent precept the reality is here and why we can know what we know. Thank you for listening and God bless you and let me know what you think. Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're on uh, Circular Reasoning Part 2, uh, True Forms, uh, dot WordPress, and we're looking at uh, Cornelius van Til's book, a survey, a Christian epistemology, page 173 to 174. And uh, he, he says, the thing that has gradually shown itself to be of momentous importance is this fact that all reasoning in the field of knowledge must take into consideration the difference between those whose concept and those who reject Christian theism. Whatever method we employ, we will have to figure from the outset with the dif this difference. No longer how I may obtain knowledge of some object with which I come in contact, nor is it only the question of how I may impart that knowledge to my fellow man in general. The question is rather how I may impart the knowledge that I have to, that I have to those who by virtue of their opposition have no true knowledge and yet think they have. Something of this was brought out when we said that God's knowledge of himself and God's knowledge of the facts of the universe must be the standard of, of knowledge. God is completely self-conscious and therefore knows himself and all things analytically. That is, God's thoughts complete coherent. Keeping this in mind, we may say that if we are to have coherence in our thinking, it will have to be a coherence that corresponds to God's coherence. According, our coherence will never be completely inclusive in the way that God's coherence is completely inclusive, our coherence will be no more than analogy or the, co or the coherence of God. Yet because it is based upon God's coherence, it will be true knowledge. Our coherence can constantly grow in comprehensiveness, but it cannot grow in truthfulness. Those that have the least knowledge have true knowledge just as well as those that have the greatest knowledge if only their knowledge is truly analogical, i.e. based upon the knowledge that God has of himself and of the world. If this fundamental point is not forgotten, we can speak in the ordinary epistemological language. We may then say that we employ the methods of analysis and synthesis. What we mean by synthesis is not that which uh, Bosanquet means by synthesis when he says that reality is essentially synthetic. Our conception of God maintains that the reverse of that. But for us, the time series brings forth that which is new for us. Accordingly, we have to synthesize the new facts with the old facts. Uh, then when we need once more to see what the new facts thus related to the old facts together reveal about God and reality in general. In this respect, the process of knowledge is a growth into the truth. For this reason, we have spoken of the Christian theistic method as the method of implication into, into the truth of God. It is reasoning in a spiral fashion rather than in a linear fashion. Accordingly, we have said that we can use the old terms deduction and induction if only we remember that they must be thought of as elements in this one process of implication into the truth of God. If we begin the course of spiral reasoning at any point in the finite universe as we must because that is the proximate starting point of all reasoning, 
we, we can call the method of implication into the truth of God as transcendental method. That is, we must seek to determine what presuppositions are necessary to any object of knowledge in order that it may be intelligible to us. It is not as though we to begin with, irrespective of the existence of God, in order then to reason from such a beginning to further conclusion. It is certainly true that if God has any significance for any object of knowledge at all, the relation of God to that object of knowledge must be taken into consideration from the outset. It is this fact that the transcendental method seeks to recognize. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Um, it's kind of gone off for some reason. I can't. It's a little bit uh, frustrating. Uh, something wrong with, with the computer. Um, I think that um, I think Okay, um, computer went down uh, for a minute then. So we'll just finish the reading of Van Til. Even in paradise, it was God's verbal self disclosure and the disclosure of his will for man's activity in relation to the created cosmos that was indispensable for man's ability to identify any fact and to relate any fact properly to any other fact. Applying this to the scripture, it is but put neutral, but neutral that we should accept the scripture testimony about itself. If we did anything else, we would not be accepting scripture as absolute. The only alternative then to bring in a God who testifies of himself and upon whose testimony we are wholly independent is not to bring in God at all, and not to bring in God at all spells nothing in that case knowledge may be said to be reduced to the pass of drawing circles in a void and we must return the charge of circular reasoning to those who made it on the other hand we are happy to accept the charge of circular reasoning our reasoning frankly depends upon the revelation of God whose reasoning is within the internal circularity of the three persons of the Trinity it is only if we frankly depend on the validity of our reasoning upon this internal circular reasoning and the triune God that we can escape tr trying in vain to reason in circles in a vacuum of pure contingency. So basically he's, he's using the Trinity 
um, as a way of showing that circular reasoning is valid within the Christian system and it is not valid in the skeptical uh, system. I think what he's trying to say is, is that if the universe starts, you start to reason and use logic and argument and whatever, how do you account for your circular reasoning within that worldview and it's inconsistent, it doesn't make sense. Whereas if you presuppose the Bible and you have the Trinity, the Trinity means that the universe did not start by chance, it start, started by uh, relationship. And therefore, reasoning is within that sphere of the universe, a universe that was created by a trying God who is for relationship. So reasoning is not in a vacuum, reasoning has its purpose, it has its function uh, given to it. Where uh, and its and its explanation. So I think that's what can uh, Van Til is saying. Um, please let me know uh, if you disagree or agree. Thank you for listening. Van Til. Hi, folks. This is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you and we're looking at Cornelius Van Til and his work and I hope that you're going to be blessed by this short series of just looking at some of his thinking, what he has to say and just giving you more on what he has to say. Um, I will be putting these videos on other channels so you will be able to comment there. Um, so I hope that you find what I'm about to do a blessing. Um, so without further ado, let's read uh, Van Til. Information can be found on True Forms and it's in his book, uh, True Forms website and in his book, uh, The Defense of Faith, Cornelius Van Til, page 123 and 127. He says, there are those of course who deny that they're they need any form of authority. They are popular atheist and agnostic. Such men say that they must be shown by reason what um, whatever they are to accept as true. But the great thinkers among non-Christian men have taken no such position. They know that they prove reality with their knowledge. They are therefore willing to admit that there may be others who have information that they themselves do not possess. So everywhere and in all respects the lesser minds are bound to submit to the authority of greater minds. The natural man would gladly allow for the idea of authority if only it be the authority of the expert in the use of reason. Such a conception of authority is quite consistent with the assumption of the sinner's autonomy. On the other hand, the conception of authority as something that stands above reason is unacceptable to the natural man. But it is not easy to distinguish in every instance when authority is considered to be above reason. There are some forms of authority that might seem at first sight to be above reason, while in reality they are not. First, there is the need for the authority that grows out of the existence of endless multiplicity of factual material. For those who do not believe that all that happens in time happens because of the plan of God, the activity of time is identical with that of chance. It is this conception of the ultimacy of time and a pure factuality on which modern philosophy has laid such great stress. It is of the great importance to know that the natural man need not in the least object to the kind of authority that is involved in the, in the, in the idea of irrationalism, and that chiefly for two reasons. In the first place, the irrationalism of our day is the direct lineal descent of the rationalism of previous days. The idea of pure, pure chance has been inherent in every form of non-Christian thought in the past. It is the only logical alternative to the position of Christianity according to which the plan of God is back of all. The idea of pure factuality or pure chance as ultimate is but the idea of otherness made explicit. Given the non-Christian non assumption with respect to man's autonomy, the idea of chance has equal rights with the idea of logic. The second place, modern in the least encroached upon the domain of the intellect as the na natural man thinks of it. 
irrationalism has merely taken possession of that which the intellect by its own admission cannot in any case control. Irrationalism has a secret treaty with the rationalism by which the former cedes to the later so much as its territory as the later can at any given time find the force to control. Irrationalism has promised to keep out of its own territory any form of authority that might be objectionable to the autonomous intellect. The very The very idea of pure factuality or chance is the best guarantee that no true authority, such as that of God, as the creative judge of man, will ever comfort man. There is a second kind of authority that the natural man is quite ready to accept it. It does not spring as did the first from the fact. Um, I'm going to have to go because my uncle is here. Um, just basically, um, I think what he's describing is uh, modernism and existentialism there. Uh, I think basically if you don't believe in God, how is history moving in the historical flow? That's basically the question. And if there is no God, then history is moving by chance. That is direct contradiction to what reason is. Reason is ordered process of thinking. So how do you get ordered process of thinking in the historical flow of chance? Christianity says... Yeah, come in, Steve.